An oligopoly industry has the following attributes. First, there are a few firms. Second, all the firms are large. And third, there may or may not be free entry and exit to the industry. What constitutes few firms is open to debate. Let's simply say that few is more than one and less than many. Typically, oligopoly industries could be comprised from anywhere from perhaps two to 15 firms. Because all the firms in an oligopoly industry are large, each firm can affect the market price. However, because there's more than one firm, no single firm can completely control the market price. These two attributes make for very interesting interactions among the firms. Suppose an airline industry is comprised of four major firms, Southwest, US Air, Continental, and Delta. Suppose all the firms charge $400 for a round-trip ticket from New York to San Francisco. Assume that the firms don't negotiate any deals among each other. If Southwest increases its price to $450, what should the other firms do? The answer is nothing. When Southwest increases its price, many of its customers will switch to the other airlines. Because Southwest is large, the other airlines can't accommodate all of Southwest customers. But because Southwest is large, the customers constitute a large number of new customers coming to the other airlines. As long as the other firms hold their prices at $400, their unit sales will increase, as will their profits. If one of the firms raises its price to $450 also, that firm, like Southwest, will lose many of its customers to its competitors. Thus, in an oligopoly industry, when one firm raises its price, the best response of the other firms is to do nothing. Now, suppose Southwest lowers its price to $350. Because Southwest is large, it can accommodate a significant number of customers who will leave the other airlines because their prices are now higher. Any firm that matches Southwest's price cut will keep its customers, plus pick up some of the customers from the firms that don't match the price cut. So, in an oligopoly industry, when one firm lowers its price, the best response of the other firms is to lower their prices also. Now, recall that the slope of a firm's demand curve reflects the degree of control the firm has over the market price of its product. When the single oligopoly firm raised its price, the other oligopoly firms did nothing. So the market price rose, but not by much. When the single oligopoly firm lowered its price, the other oligopoly firms lowered their prices also. So the market price dropped significantly. In short, the degree of control the single oligopoly firm has over the market price varies depending on whether that single firm is increasing or decreasing its price. When the firm increases its price, it exhibits little control over the market price. But when the firm decreases its price, it exhibits much control over the market price. This means that the oligopoly firm's demand and marginal revenue curves must have two slopes, steep for when the firm exhibits much control and flat for when the firm exhibits little control. Here are the two demand curves the oligopoly firm faces. The curves marked D1 and MR1 are the demand and marginal revenue curves the oligopoly faces when it attempts to raise its price. The curves marked D2 and MR2 are the demand and marginal revenue curves the oligopoly faces when it attempts to lower its price. In equilibrium, all of the oligopoly firms will charge the price that's found at the intersection of the two demand curves. At point A, all of the oligopoly firms are charging the same price for their products. Because the oligopoly firm is sometimes on the flat set of demand marginal revenue curves, and sometimes on the steep set of demand and marginal revenue curves, the oligopoly firm does not use the entirety of either curve. The oligopoly firm is never on D2 or MR2 when the price rises above point A. Similarly, the oligopoly firm is never on D1 or MR1 when the price falls below point A. Now, Let's remove the sections of the demand and marginal revenue curves that the oligopoly doesn't use. What we have left is called a kinked demand curve, but it's actually the portions of two separate demand curves. 
Similarly, the marginal revenue curve appears to be broken, but it's in fact two separate marginal revenue curves. Here's a typical oligopoly firm. Let's call it US Airways. The firm's profit maximizing output quantity is where MR and MC intersect, or 12,000 passengers per day. The price the firm charges is $400 per seat. Its average total cost is $250 per seat, and it's earning an economic profit of $150 per passenger per day, or $1.8 million a day. U.S. Airways' efficient output level is located at the minimum of the average total cost curve, or 15,000 passengers per day. Because U.S. Air will choose to produce at the profit-maximizing output level, the airline will be inefficient. So far, we've assumed that the firms don't negotiate deals amongst each other. But suppose now that the firms can negotiate deals. When U.S. Airways raises its price, the best response of the other airlines is to raise their price also, provided nobody's dropping their prices. If all the airlines can raise their prices together, no firm loses its customers to the others, and all of them benefit from the higher price. In effect, if the firms can negotiate some way to act in concert, they act like a single monopoly firm. We call this arrangement a cartel. A cartel is a special case of oligopoly in which the firms collude or they work together. Here's our oligopoly firm that's now colluding with the other firms as a member of a cartel. Because the flat demand and marginal revenue curves no longer apply, we find that the firm's profit maximizing output is where the steep MR curve intersects the marginal cost curve, or point C. We follow this point up to the steep demand curve to find the price the cartel will charge. From this analysis, we see that as a cartel, the firms are producing fewer units, 10,000 seats a day instead of 12,000 seats a day. They're charging a higher price, $450 a seat instead of $400 a seat. And their average total cost has risen from $250 a seat to $260 a seat. The firm's profits have also risen from $1.8 million per day to $1.9 million per day. Now, oligopoly firms make more profit when they enter into a cartel arrangement. So why don't all oligopolies become cartels? Suppose 10 oligopoly firms enter into a cartel arrangement. Each of these firms agrees to restrict its output and to charge a higher price for its product. Because all of the firms raise their prices together, no firm loses its customers to another firm, and all of them benefit from having a higher price for their product. Now think about what a single one of those firms should do. A single firm could make even more profit by cheating on the cartel. By lowering its price below that of the cartel members, that single firm can increase its unit sales by taking customers away from the cartel firms. This behavior is called chiseling. Chiseling is the breaking of the cartel arrangement. Because the oligopoly industry can come in one of three states, standard oligopoly, cartel, and chiseling, there are three levels of economic profit a firm in an oligopoly industry can earn. A firm in a standard oligopoly earns economic profit. Because they act in concert, firms in a cartel earn more economic profit than they do as standard oligopolies. Because it cheats on the cartel arrangement, a firm that chisels earns even more economic profit than it would in the cartel. These three profit levels make the cartel unstable. When firms form a cartel, each one has an incentive to chisel on the others. In fact, when one firm does chisel, not only does that firm make much more economic profit, but the other firm's profits fall considerably. So even if a firm all on its own would not consider chiseling, it has an incentive to do so just to avoid being chiseled on by another firm. 
Once one firm chisels, other firms will join in the chiseling. When this happens, all the firms have broken the cartel arrangement and the industry is back to being a standard oligopoly. While the profit maximizing output quantity for the firm in a standard oligopoly is to the left of the efficient output quantity, the profit maximizing output quantity for the firm in a cartel is even further to the left. The cartel is even more inefficient than the oligopoly. So it's important to understand uh, oligopolies because it helps us not to be afraid of them. Our, our natural fear is that you get a handful of large firms and they'll come together and they'll restrict output and drive the price up and now be extorting money from, from the customers. And The Economist says don't worry about that. There are built-in economic forces that will tear a cartel apart. When a cartel forms, and they will form, there's tremendous economic incentive for the firms to cheat on this cartel. And when they cheat, the cartel breaks apart and the price comes back down again. So the economist would argue, leave the thing alone. And in fact, if we try and step in and regulate this oligopoly, what can often happen is that we end up either being too late in our regulation or the, the regulation we impose actually does more harm than good and we end up in a worse state than we would have been had we just let the thing play out.